Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first ever live stream only service at Glebe Chapel. It'll feel a bit different this week, and so we thank you for your support and patience as we do everything we can to seek to serve you during this unusual time. Notices this week are very different. All of our activities have been postponed until further notice. However, this evening the Evangelical Alliance have called people to pray uh, about the pandemic at seven o'clock in the evening and request that we place a candle in our windows to show that that is what we are doing. Just make sure you don't uh, um, set light to the curtains. Um, our priority is communication and support for you. If you're connected with or a part of Glebe Chapel, we'd really encourage you to be linked with one of our home groups. Home groups are a small group of people who look out for each other. Keep in contact so that we can support you and you can support others. So if that applies to you, please contact the email below this video. We're really keen to have everyone in email or phone contact. So if you haven't been receiving emails, contact us with an email address so we can send you updates and articles and items to encourage you in your faith. So, if you haven't already, please press on the subscribe button uh, on YouTube and the bell symbol to keep you up to date with Glee Chapel on YouTube. Let's bow and pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we bring you our worship, praise and thanksgiving. Thank you for your love that sent our Lord Jesus to be the light of the world and to be our rescuer. We praise you for his self-giving life his sacrificial death for us on the cross. And we praise you that you gloriously raised him from death and that he lives today. Thank you that you call us into relationship with you so we can know you as our help, our refuge and our strength, our solid rock, the foundation for living. Thank you that as you help us to depend on you, we can find strength and support through the darkness and difficulties we face in life. We thank you for this technology that brings us together this morning and we ask you to bless our fellowship as we worship you separately and yet joined and linked together as a community of faith. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read a scripture from the book of Philippians and chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, whatever is true, 
whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. A word on COVID-19, written by somebody called Gary Dull, not the best name for a speaker, but a pastor from the States. This is what he's written. So how does one get to the place of trusting God and seeking his provision? Perhaps remembering the following facts about God will help. God is in control. So depend upon him to do what is right. God has a purpose, so watch for him to work. God will provide, so trust in him to deliver. God has a mission, so declare his truth. God has a remedy, so praise him for what he will do. Even though there's a lot of advice being given in the world as to how to respond to this crisis, the sooner one focuses on who God is, what God expects, and how God works, and then is convinced of the fact that God causes, allows, and directs all things according to his sovereign plan, the more one will experience the strength, hope, peace, comfort and confidence that only God can provide. As we read in Philippians and in the original text, the meaning is don't be over anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Yes, if we can follow that comforting admonition from Scripture, we will experience the provision of God and all that is needed to face this pandemic crisis or any other troubling issue that we will encounter in life. We can remember the words of the old hymn written by Sevilla D. Martin that says, Be not dismayed whate'er betide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart does fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, he will provide, God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. We're going to sing, My Jesus, My Saviour.
think this is uh, Mother's Day that we're all going to remember. There's no getting away from the fact that it's been a strange week, a strange month, and will be an unusual spring. With all the change and uncertainty that comes, there comes a level of anxiety, worry for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our country, and for the world, especially the most vulnerable. On this unusual Mother's Day, when we might not have been able to see our loved ones because travel plans are cancelled, or because of isolation and that awful term, social distancing, let's remember that as a church we're called to support each other, to carry each other's burdens and to care for one another. There's a book entitled it takes a church to raise a parent, playing on the words that it takes a village to raise a child. That sentiment is true. We all have a part to play in mothers, fathers, grandparents and children's lives as a church. For all the mothers and caregivers out there, working their socks off, we celebrate you. Nurse, provider, counsellor, fashion expert, or not, playmate, best friend, drill sergeant, chef, maybe, DIYer, admin guru, all of these come under the role of mum, as well as so much more. And it's the so much more that I want us to think about this morning. The next reading is from a lady who challenged her church pastor about Mother's Day focusing on the surface. She wrote this comparison between mothers in the Bible and mothers now. Asking the question, is, it, is our stage big enough? Christians often say that the Bible talks about all sorts of issues that we're looking for answers to in these days, that it's completely relatable to. And so she asked the question, is it for mothers? And here is her answer. Beyond the surface of mothering. Forgive us when we assume that what we see on the surface is all there is to your story. We know in our midst that there are women and mothers and caregivers who, like Eve, have children with serious rivalry. Like Hagar, have been discarded for a new family and are mothering alone. Like Naomi, who've tasted the bitterness of a child's death. Like the mother of Leah and Rachel, who knows what it is to have one child favoured over another by society. Like Hannah, separated from your child at a young age. Like Mary, having a complicated pregnancy story, or like Tamar, have tried multiple ways to become a mother, or like Rachel, who've counted the months and years while other women in their family and circle of friends have become pregnant, who like Rebecca, are drawn to one of your children more than the others. Like David's mother, raising children after God's heart, and though you rejoice in watching them, you don't want to rub that in face in your friends' faces. Like Ham's mother, have children whose substance abuse can cause problems. Like Bathsheba, have children who may die. Like Joseph and Benjamin, 
experiencing the death of their mother. Like Mary, have children with public legal situations and all you can do is watch. Like the Shumanite woman who, when told by Elisha that she would become pregnant, replied, no, please don't mislead your servant. Like her, not wanting to open doors of hope, only to have them slammed in your face. Like Hannah, have known the provoking of a family member, like many, watching their mother's age and waste before their eyes. Like Moses' mother, reluctantly giving up her child because it wasn't safe for her to bring up the child herself. Or like Pharaoh's daughter, called to love and nurture children who weren't yours by birth. Like Timothy's mother and grandmother, steadily and without much fanfare or recognition, teaching their children the truths of God, sowing seeds for eternity. Like the unnamed women, who never quite fit into the norms of society, either never marrying or having children, yet wanting to. You are in our midst. We're called to be a people who rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Today our stage is big enough to do both. For the seen and known joys of motherhood, we rejoice and smile and celebrate with you. For the seen and known suffering in motherhood, we ache with you. For the private, unseen and unknown joys of motherhood, like Mary, may you treasure them in your hearts. And for the private, unseen and unknown sorrows and suffering of motherhood, may you know that you don't always have to be happy in our midst. You are engraved on the palms of God, both seen and unseen, held together by him. Let us pray. We want to pray for all mothers and grandmothers and aunties and caregivers on this Mother's Day. Thank you that you see under the surface, on the big, real and very varied stage that all of us have as a part of our experience of being mothers and giving care. We pray for ourselves, for your help to love and respect those who care for us. And especially in our world, so affected by fear and anxiety, we remember before you mothers and caregivers caring for children in war zones, as refugees, with those who have nowhere to call home and no healthcare system to rely on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to sing another song, uh, In Christ Alone.
Chapel, if you uh, are tuning in for the first time or you've just stumbled across us, um, it's great you've made it onto our YouTube channel and I really hope um, that this virtual service is a blessing to you. Now there's no doubt about it, this is an unusual Sunday. COVID-19, aka the, con the coronavirus, has definitely taken control of the UK. Everything on the news is COVID-19, schools have closed, pubs have closed, restaurants have shut. Good job the takeaways are still open. Internet providers are actually struggling with demand because of people like us. But COVID-19 is not just making us act differently, it's making us think differently as well. The BBC published a report yesterday by doctors encouraging family members to have conversations with their loved ones about what to do if they get the virus and the worst case happens. What to do if they contract the virus and they die. Now my mum has lupus and so I can relate to this conversation. She's got lupus and a whole host of other um, illnesses that go alongside it. We often used to joke that she could go to the medical school in Glasgow and the students could walk around her and come out with their degree. And so often it would feel like her life was hanging in the balance. Growing up, any flu or cold could spell disaster. We had the norovirus one Christmas and we all had to stay away from each other. Even routine blood tests for her could come back and we would be excited and happy that things were the same. And the next blood test, we could be into a period where we really had to look out for her. Now my life as a child and as a teenager was full of love and joy and laughter, but it was also full of fear and of worry about my mum. Now I'm fortunate that that has left me in the position where I can have conversations with my family and friends about some of the biggest things in life, and that is illness and death, without it seeming unusual. Although the truth is, for many of us, and for a lot of my friends and extended family, that is a very difficult conversation to have. And the virus has very literally made us stop and think. What is the point to life? On top of that, and sometimes the, the more immediate and more troubling question, is who is in control of my life? At the blink of an eye, the statement of a Prime Minister, and everything closes. The streets are empty. You, can buy, you can't buy certain things in the store because people are buying them up too quickly. Panic and fear has set in overnight. Who is in control? We receive the news and we hear time and time again experts coming on and saying, well, this could happen and that could happen and this could happen. But at the end of the interview, when they're really pushed, they just go, we don't really know. We're not sure. Who is in control? And I believe the answer for that lies in Romans 5, verses 1 
to 5. And it says this, Therefore, since you have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character uh, strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this is the hope that will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Now, the book of Romans is a great letter. It confronts us with two things, and that is our sin. And it confronts us with the fact that God loves us and that Christ has died so that we can have grace and have a relationship with God. And it fundamentally asks the one question the whole way through, who is in control of your life? Romans 5 is saying that God wants to be in control of your life. It's saying that circumstances will happen. Viruses, wars, personal issues like redundancy, marriage breakup, illnesses, maybe not achieving what you thought you would with your life. All of these things may happen. But you know what? Romans 5 is saying if you open your life up to God, you will find that he has already opened his life up to you. No matter what is going on, you will, we will find ourselves singing his praises and rejoicing in God's mercy on us and how much he loves us. Romans 5 is also saying that in times like this, when trials come on and things get difficult, we learn endurance. We will learn to rely on God in a way we have never had to before, to trust that he really is in control of our lives. Because we open our lives to God, and he opens his to us, we can expect him to work in us and through us despite and maybe even because of our circumstances. The Holy Spirit will pour out his blessings on us. Or in this version it says, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. The Holy Spirit will pour out blessings on us. Blessings that do not fade and waste away like the things we so often put our hope in. The hope of going to work tomorrow. The hope of going to the shops tomorrow. The hope of having money, possessions, even hope in people. Because all those things will fade. Although God is a generous God and he blesses us with those things, his real true blessings is knowing the love that he has for us in our hearts. Turning to God may not spare you from contracting the coronavirus. It's not that sort of blessing, although God is a good God. It's the blessing of peace and of hope. I have a really good friend in Germany. He's called Alex, and he has had umpteen heart operations. Um, he was uh, the first minor in the UK to survive a certain heart operation, and I'm talking child minor, not pickaxe and hat minor. Um, but he was the first to survive. He's now in his 30s. And quite like my mum in Scotland, life is uncertain. Every year Alex has to have uh, a electrolysis to shock his heart back into rhythm. He has to have every two or three years a battery replaced in his heart. And if you sit next to him and you're quiet, you can hear the tick, tick, tick of his, of his automatic heart working. And a bit like us just now, there are certain things that he just can't do. Certain times where he can't leave the house, he has to stay at home. And his life should be wrapped in fear and in the certainty of death. But it isn't. It's wrapped in joy and in hope. In knowing that something better is coming. And he clings to the promises that God has for him. The promise that when death finally comes, or when trials come, or when the coronavirus comes to new end, that is not the end. 
hardship is not the end. Not only that, but he trusts that God will look after his family. God will provide. You know, it says in the Bible, in Jeremiah, that God has a plan for us and it is to prosper us and not to harm us. It says that God is our Father and he loves us more than we can imagine. Later in Romans 5, verses 8 to 11, it says, God showed his great love to us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God has been restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Since now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, because Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. While we were still his enemies, while we were still enemies with God, while we, while we still hadn't accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offers, while we still stood very much in our sin and our mistakes, Jesus offered us salvation. And if we accept that, we are in a new relationship with God. The chance to be God's friend, to be part of his family, despite what we've done, despite what we've not done. Death should be our burden to carry, but Christ has taken that for us. We carry life. My mum and Alex, my good friend, who live with uncertainty every day, should live with fear of death, and they don't. They just don't because that is the promise of God. If we repent, if we turn ourselves from what we are towards God and ask Jesus into our hearts by accepting that our sins are our mistakes and asking Jesus to take them away and to change our life, we will be friends with the Almighty God. Friends of God, not just another servant or another follower, but a friend, an intimate, close, life-sharing friend. That is the hope we have. In Mark chapter 4, we read a story about Jesus and his disciples on a boat and a great storm comes and threatens to wreck the boat. The disciples are crippled, the disciples are crippled by fear and they wake Jesus who is sleeping and they say, save us, we're going to drown. And Jesus replies, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then comes the storm. The passage ends with the disciples being scared, but now of Jesus' great power rather than the storm. And imagine some of us are feeling like we are at the beginning of, or maybe are in a storm, whether it's because of the coronavirus or because of personal issues, trapped on a boat that is potentially going down. Well, let's have faith. Like Romans 5 says, let's use this trouble to more deeply look for answers to our questions in God's word. Let's use this trial to develop endurance focusing on hope that no matter what happens, if you have faith in Jesus, he will save you. You can live knowing that something better is coming, not a temporary thing, but an eternal thing, sharing in God's glory, which gives us purpose now and a future to look forward to. Let's become a church that is looking at the eternal and not the temporary. We read again in Romans, but Romans chapter 8, yet we suffer now, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation is subjected to curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Trusting in Jesus during hardship does not mean that the suffering disappears. 
although God is a merciful God. Trusting in Jesus does not necessarily mean that you will wake up tomorrow fearless. What trusting in God looks like is us saying, I am scared, but you are a good God. I am sick, help me to understand your bigger purpose. I am lonely, God help me to feel your presence more. It's saying that I am not in control of my own life and I do not want to be. I want God to take control of my life and to help me to live in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. It's giving God the reins to your life and trusting that no matter what happens, now or in the future, Jesus has given us a hope that will last forever and ever. Now we're going to sing one final song. And if something has been said this morning that has touched your heart or touched your mind or made you think about something that you hadn't before, please get in contact with us through the email below this video. We would love to talk some more. Over the next few weeks we will be doing some more videos on this channel. We'll have emails and Facebook encouragements, so please take advantage of them. We have a real chance here in this time to dive into God's Word and don't be shy, of, don't shy away from the tough questions but look for the answers in God's Word. Thank you.
Chapel, we often close our service using the words of the grace, and uh, we can speak that to one another. So, wherever you are, I wonder if you can imagine some of the people that you would usually see, and let's share in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you very much for being with us this morning and we look forward to you joining with us in this way um, in future weeks. Thank you. <laughs>